Her lab investigates the biology underlying prosocial emotions and behaviors, and her dissertation focused on molecular, cellular, and behavioral studies of the amygdala, the key brain structure for emotion, emotional processing. She was a postdoctoral research scholar at Stanford University under the guidance of Robert Sapolsky, where she investigated the role of stress hormones on the brain's emotional circuitry. At the University of California, Berkeley, Saturn was a postdoctoral fellow in Dr. Uh, Keltner's lab, and here she began her attempts to bridge neuroscience and social psychology. So let's please welcome Dr. Saturn. Thank you. Okay, can you hear me? Uh, first, I'd like to start by thanking Darsha and the conference organizers for having me here. Um, all my wonderful collaborators and students who made this work possible, uh, the folks that gave us money to give, uh, do the research, including NSF, and finally, all of you for sticking around for this last session. So I've been thinking about emotions in my research for the past 20 years, um, investigating how they come in a variety of flavors from the first day that we are born. As we all know, emotions can be completely empowering or debilitating. And emotions have essentially evolved to teach us the people, places, and things that have brought us well-being and those that have brought us harm. So I started my career studying fear and the stress response. It's the strongest emotional response. We'd all probably be dead by now if we didn't have a strong stress response. It's a universal survival mechanism. And what's really fascinating is there's the same rudimentary neural architecture when you go from species to species, especially the mammalian species. So I spent a lot of time um, in the amygdala, studying how it's basically involved from getting information from our sensory organs, such as our eyes or our ears. It can also be our wild imagination, watching the news. And the amygdala, in turn, is responsible for telling our body what to do in order to respond appropriately to an emotional event. We know that the amygdala initiates the stress response via the HPA axis, which is the hypothalamus pituitary adrenal axis, also activates the sympathetic nervous system, known as our fight or flight system. And these stress hormones that are released are responsible for getting our heart racing, our blood pumping, our muscles mobilized in order to rise to the occasion. This slide is just to illustrate that these stress hormones have a way of feeding back to the brain. Um, cortisol is the major glu glucocorticoid in humans, has a way of passing the blood-blame barrier. Adrenaline and noradrenaline, also known as epinephrine and norepinephrine, do not, but they can feed back into the brain via the vagus nerve. And so we spend a lot of time studying how stress impacts the brain. We know that stress, especially chronic stress, is responsible for making cells in the amygdala, the emotional core of our brain, to grow and to make new connections. On the flip side, stress can make the hippocampal cells. The hippocampus is responsible for learning and memory, especially in the short term, to actually shrink and wither away. So you have the opposite relationship taking place. Likewise, in the prefrontal cortex, which is responsible for high order analytical thinking, is the part of the brain that we believe makes us uniquely human because it is very, very different um, in our species versus others. You also see this atrophy or the shrinkage of neurons um, after chronic stress. So when I was um, on studying the pathology of the brain due to destructive emotions, I started musing about how we can blunt what stress does to our brains and also our bodies. As we all know, intuitively and intellectually, stress can wreak havoc on our muscles, on our memory, on our sleep patterns, it can even manifest itself in our skin, in our heart, and our digestive system as well. And so I thought about how we might be able to fight stress with pro-social behaviors, actions that benefit others. Just like the stress response, pro-social behaviors are a universal survival mechanism. 
And again, you can see the same rudimentary neural architecture when you go from species to species. We've learned a lot about oxytocin in this conference, and so I'll just go over this quickly, that we know oxytocin is really, really key for prosocial behaviors. Um, as we learned from others um, in this conference, it's responsible for pair bond formation, uh, romantic love, and this biobehavioral synchrony that Ruth Feldman talked about earlier today. I also have a new baby, so I took the liberty of sprinkling pictures of her on my slides. Um, we know that oxytocin has potential um, physiological anti-stress effects. So oxytocin has been shown to modulate stress hormone levels. It also inhibits how much our hearts will respond to stress. And furthermore, it's been shown to attenuate how much the amygdala responds to emotional stimuli. So it has a very, very strong relationship with the stress response. And as many of you know, oxytocin experiments have shown more recently how it's involved in prosocial behavior in both males and females. If you give oxytocin intranasally, it's been shown to dramatically increase generosity, trust, eye gaze, and even the ability to infer the emotions of other people. Now, if you measure oxytocin um, levels that are just circulating naturally, as we learned again earlier, it's been shown to directly relate to parent and child bonding, and this is both for the mother and the father. Feelings of romantic love and trust. And in addition, empathy and even this generosity towards strangers. So a lot of my research centers around this idea of what causes individual differences in our social and emotional profiles. And I started musing about this when I was studying animal models, noticing that the social environment would have a huge impact on the different behaviors of the animals that I was studying. And to study genetic predisposition, which is basically mother nature's little tricks for making us a bit different, is very much like a natural pharmacological manipulation. And I'll be talking about work in the oxytocin system, which we know, as I mentioned, is res responsible for attachment, nurturance, empathy, and so forth. Um, and this is just an attempt to mention a couple other systems, such as the dopamine system, which, as you all know, is responsible for reward. We know it's really, really activated during um, pro-social behaviors for both the people that we care about and also for complete strangers. There's also the serotonin system, responsible for things like libido, appetite, mood, sleep, but also this attunement system to other people. And this leaves out other systems like um, the opioid system, which we know is really involved in pro-social behaviors, also prolactin. And so this is not exhaustive, but just an illustration of all these different systems responsible for pro-social behavior, such as cooperation, altruism, and compassion. So polymorphisms is just a fancy word for many forms. They're ubiquitous across many, many species, not just the animal kingdom and also the plant kingdom. It will dictate like the color of plants. In the animal kingdom, polymorphisms will decide who will be royalty, who will be a worker, because it'd be a fiasco if every bee in the colony wanted to be the queen. And so Mother Nature has a way of sorting these things out. They also dictate things like our blood type, our eye color, and so forth. And before I show you this data, I just want to bring forth the fact that this world would be extremely boring if we all looked the same, acted the same, and behaved the same way. And we know that genetic polymorphisms have been shown to relate to the serotonin system, as you probably know, the propensity to develop depression um, and emotional reactivity. It's also been related to the uh, dopaminergic system for things like reward-seeking behaviors, the propensity to develop addictions, and so forth. So we focused on the oxytocin receptor, 
And as you all learned already, that it has um, targets all over the body and the brain, including the hypothalamus, the amygdala, the heart, and the parasympathetic branch. And so you've seen some genetic data before, so I'll go over this quickly. Just a reminder for the non-genetic people, we have two alleles. We get one from our mother, one from our father. And so I'll be talking about the A alleles for this particular polymorphism um, called RS53576. So I mentioned how oxytocin has very potent anti-stress effects. So first we wanted to see how genetic variation in the oxytocin receptor might relate to stress reactivity. And to do this, we did a classic startup paradigm in the lab, presenting loud noise bursts over headphones. And we looked at the heart rate of our participants during this particular task. And what we essentially found was that individuals with two copies of the G allele um, exhibited less physiological stress reactivity than individuals that had one or two copies of the A allele. And this was basically in beats per minute. This is showing data from um, males and females just because oftentimes, um, as you learn, people traditionally thought that there were huge differences in the oxytonergic system in males versus females, but we found the same thing across um, both genders. We also asked people about their stress reactivity. How much do you freak out during an emergency or a crisis? And to do this, we basically devised this scale to measure this unidimensional um, uh, measure of how people react um, under really stressful situations. And this scale has been shown to be negatively associated with things like resilience and emotional appraisal. And it's positively correlated with rumination and perceived stress. And we discovered that this GG group, the same individuals that showed less stress reactivity physiologically with their heartbeat, also reported to have less stress reactivity during stressful situations. So then we sought out to see if the same genetic variation would influence prosociality. So we use the classic um, interpersonal reactivity um, index, which you've heard about before, which has been around for decades. It's been well validated to basically look at this um, other-oriented um, empathetic behavior. Some dimensions include, I often have tender, concerned feelings for other people. And perspective taking, how well are you able to put yourself in the shoes of other people? And you should see the reverse pattern. So individuals in this GG group, the same that displayed less stress reactivity, both physiologically and with self-report, reported more empathy with this interpersonal reactivity scale. We then did the reading the mind in the eyes task, which was devised by Simon Baron Cohen, who happens to be Sasha Baron Cohen's cousin. Um, he's an autism expert, and it's been shown that this performance in this tag is, uh, task is negatively associated with autism. And if you give it to a non-clinical sample, they actually perform better on this task. So I thought it'd be fun to try out a few of these items on all of you. So raise your hand if you think this man looks jealous. How about panicked? Arrogant? Or hateful? Good job. <laughs> Let's try um, this one. Is this bloke alarmed? Shy? Hostile? Or anxious? Well done. Uh, one final example. Is this woman grateful? <laughs> Flirtatious? <laughs> Hostile? Or disappointed? Great, lots of oxytocin in this room, I'm very impressed. <laughs> so we found that individuals in this GG group, the same ones that displayed rest, uh, less stress reactivity and more self-reported empathy, actually performed better on this reading the mind in the eyes task. We also did this task where we had strangers view couples listening to each other talk about a time of suffering in their lives. And these were silent video clips, and we were measuring um, how much this partner displayed 
compassionate or pro-social behavior towards their partner, such as leaning, nods, eye contact, smiling, and so forth. Okay, so let's uh, show you an example of some of our participants. So again, um, this man is listening to his partner, who you can't see on the screen, talk about his time of suffering in her life. And you can see he's doing a great job of this body contact, um, looking very intently at her and very compassionate. Um, compare it to this man. <laughs> Not the best partner in the world. Not making much eye contact, looking away kind of drumming his fan, this is not the type of partner you want to be or you want to have. And we found this relationship to be the same um, for both genders, as you'll see quickly. So here's another very sympathetic partner, really leaning forward, looking really, really compassionate and sympathetic. And it's possible that these folks that don't seem as invested or as pro-social are not interested, but maybe they are so overcome with their own distress, as exhibited by this oxytocin continuum, that they're unable to step outside of their own distress in order to tend to other people. Um, we should all aspire to be like this particular partner, listening very, very intently, with hand holding and so forth, listening to her partner. And, and notice her closed off expression, very hunched, very, looking very, very uncomfortable, not making eye contact. And so you see a lot of individual variation in how people respond to listening to their romantic partners talk about a time of suffering in their life. And we found that complete strangers would judge these people um, to be more pro-social. So the GG group, which exhibited more um, empathy, both with self-report and with the reading the other people's emotions, and less stress reactivity were rated more pro-social pro by com complete strangers. And others have found that the same oxytocin receptor polymorphism relates to how the amygdala and hippocampus respond to different emotional states and traits and stimuli, and also the volume of different structures in the brain responsible for emotional processing. It's been related to maternal sensitivity as well, and the, the propensity to develop autism. And unlike serotonin and dopamine, which have a medley of receptors to carry out their signaling, both ionotropic and metabotropic, oxytocin just has one receptor. And so it makes sense that a little tweak in this receptor, so the polymorphisms, as you probably know, code for the amino acids that make the proteins. And when the proteins um, are, are changed in a functional way, that will change how it binds um, to the ligand. And um, following in the thread of the media getting it all wrong, um, I was also amused and dismayed to see this parody come out about how the empathy gene has been found and cured. And this will be included in 14 inevitable scientific breakthroughs that the world will regret. Um, but we're not slaves to our genes. Um, people do go to court and have people testify, well, he has a propensity to, for violent behavior, therefore we should go easy on him. Um, but genes are just one contribution to who we are as a whole. But the implications from this data suggest that genetic variability in neurochemical systems can have um, a big impact on individual differences. And when we first got this data, um, I cried and cried. And I didn't cry because I knew we'd get a lot of media and great papers out of this. I cried because I genotyped myself and I'm in this high stress reactive low empathy group. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> but that actually helped me develop a lot of self-compassion about the different interpersonal obstacles that I've had to overcome to come out of my shell. And I do know that a lot of that had to do with um, attachment and with affection. And it's also important to realize that we all have these obstacles to achieving inner peace and prosociality. Some of us are a little bit more stress reactive than others. Some of us are a little bit more reward seeking than others. Some of us have a hard time making eye contact. 
Um, and so it's not fair to say, oh, she shouldn't be eating so much, or he really needs to um, you know, snap out of it. Uh, we all have, Mother Nature basically dealt us all a different hand, and as a result, we're all very different people. And so another huge contribution to how we are different people is how we grow up, our environment. So our friends, our teachers, our peers, our society and culture, and as we've been learning in this conference, our parents have a huge contribution to who we are. And so we looked at the parental bonding instrument, um, which you've heard about before in this conference, which basically is a retrospective measure of parenting styles during the early years of life, so the first 16 years. It's completed separately from mothers and fathers, and studies have shown that the perceptions are stable over time. So if I ask you 10 years from now or 20 years from now how your mother and father were towards you, chances are very high that it'll be the same. And it looks at different facets such as affection, soothing, and understanding. So previous studies have shown that what we call the PBI has been related to self-confidence, self-esteem, cortisol levels during stress. As Dr. Swain mentioned the activation of the neural centers for maternal care. And we've been able to replicate the data um, highlighted here in blue that it's negatively related to things like um, introversion, depression, emotional instability, um, also known as neuroticism, aggression, and loneliness. And so I just have these icons in my data slides to um, denote if it's the mother or the father being involved and the direction of um, our relationships. So we found that parental care, both maternal and paternal, relates to how much affection people give when they're young adults. So these are college age kids. Interestingly, it also relates to how much affection they're receiving in college. And so this affection can be from family, friends, and romantic partners. And what we also discovered is that people who both give and receive affection on a daily basis are more likely to score high on altruism, empathy, compassion, and love. We also have this task um, in our laboratory where we have a research assistant um, accidentally knock over a bunch of stuff in the lab, and we quantify how much they, the participant decides to help. And we discovered that people who give affection, who are given affection, are more likely to help in this particular task. And also how much they help relates to how much affection they're given on a regular basis. Parental bonding also relates to romantic affection as young adults, so how much they hold hands and kiss and cuddle and that sort of thing. And previous work has shown that this relates to oxytocin levels. Gratitude is really key. And this is very significant for both maternal and paternal care. So people who um, have a lot of affection early in life are more likely to express gratitude when they grow up. Maternal care um, is also shown in our data set to relate to altruism, trust, love, and interpersonal support. So how much people believe they have people to turn to when they're having difficulty. And here we found the fathers um, play a huge role in this as well. Maternal care relates to self-compassion, which has facets of being kind to oneself instead of ripping each other, ripping yourself apart. Um, this common humanity, believing that we're kind of all in this together as opposed to feeling very isolated with your problems, and being very mindful um, with your experience in life instead of over-identifying with them. And there's the saying that if we treated all our friends like we treat ourselves, we probably wouldn't have any friends left. And that's, that's true. We can be so hard on ourselves. And what's interesting is if mothers are very affectionate to their children early in life, they're more likely to exhibit self-compassion later on. And we've also found that self-compassion relates to pro-social traits such as gratitude, love, um, and social support. 
And there are also health outcomes, so you have better health and you sleep better. Affiliative humor style was also um, discovered. So this is a sense of humor where you basically um, enhance your relationships in a very positive way. Happiness. I'm going through some of these quickly for the sake of time. Life satisfaction. And parental care also relates to sleep quality and health. So this is very early data, and we're going to work on having more sophisticated um, data analyses to see what's going on to put a, a really nice story together. Stress reactivity as well. And um, earlier talks um, inspired me to mention that we also found this um, relationship to relate to subjective socioeconomic status and also social class. So for the last bit of my talk, I want to talk about another way we can cause individual differences in our emotional and social profiles, and that's with moral exemplars, so these pro-social role models that we have in our lives. And to look at this, we study what we call moral elevation. So moral elevation is an emotional state that we experience when we witness this great acts of prosociality, so great acts of compassion, altruism, gratitude, and even forgiveness. And these are basically actions that are perceived to have really great moral beauty and great integrity. So we all know about moral exemplars that have been um, around for a long time. And we've been talking, uh, moral exemplars have been mentioned in the literature for centuries. But just very, very recently, neuroscientists and psychologists are trying to study what this emotional state is all about, this moral excellence. So previous work has shown that moral elevation can actually boost altruism. It's been also been shown that this, this altruism will directly relate to how much they experience in the lab when they were experiencing moral elevation. And this will relate to their desire to help others, um, and also these physiological sensations of feeling really moved and warm in the chest. We were also inspired by the study of moral elevation induced in mothers who are nursing. And so they basically induced moral elevation in mothers who were breastfeeding and brought their babies to the lab. And when they were experiencing elevation, they experienced more letdown. So they were just started lactating. And, and afterwards, they were more likely to be very, very affectionate to their children. And so the authors speculated that oxytocin may be involved. So we've started to characterize the biology of moral elevation, um, starting with the vagus nerve. And again, we're just revisiting um, this wonderful nerve that's involved with the social engagement system. And it's intimately connected to both st the stress reactivity system and the oxytonergic system. And as you all know, the parasympathetic nervous system um, houses the vagus nerve, which then innervates the heart. And vagus comes from the word of wandering. It's also been called the love nerve. Um, not only does it modulate our hearts and our brains, but also the social engagement system that I mentioned to facilitate nodding, and eye contact, and this open, leaning gesture of care. Some people naturally have low vagal tone, and unfortunately, they're more um, uh, vulnerable to things like psychiatric disease, obesity, heart problems, and so forth. And the lucky people who have high vagal tone are more likely to have more positive emotions, appear more trustworthy to strangers. This relates to their offspring as well, so they tend to have more pro-social children, and also better support networks. So parasympathetic uh, system, often called rest and digest, sympathetic, fight or flight. Um, they're innervated. Um, they innervate a bunch of different organs that are responsible for dealing with emotions. And this is just to show the heart specifically. The vagus nerve um, 
This is the sinoatrial node of the heart, also known as the pacemaker of the heart. And you can see it's innervated by the vagus nerve. And it comes out of the medulla and the brainstem. And it also receives information from the uh, sympathetic nervous system as well. Sympathetic to get it aroused, to get it beating, to get it really, really pumping during a stressful event. And the vagus nerve is there to basically cause the vagal break, is what we call it, to slow down the heart. We also use um, other types of uh, stimuli. And you notice we don't have to show videos of saints here, just people that are very, very compassionate and giving to other people. And we use uh, the paradigm that's been used um, in other studies, basically having a neutral baseline and then inducing emotion. And for control, we used amusement, since amusement is another positive and social emotion, to really tease out how moral elevation is unique. What we found was that elevation can robustly boost vagal tone also as an index of parasympathetic activity. And we did not see this in the elevation group. Now, amusement is another social emotion. It's understudied, but we know that we're much, much more likely to laugh when we're with people than when we're alone. Um, but nonetheless, it's very qualitatively and quantitatively different than moral elevation. And so we measured this as respiratory sinus arrhythmia. We're polishing it now for a resubmission. And what's interesting is we also found that elevation will actually activate the sympathetic nervous system as well. And this was a bit surprising to us. We found that heart rate was increased with elevation and skin conductance as well. But this makes sense because most elevation stimuli involves seeing someone under distress that needs to be aided or rescued later on. And so we see this both, this dual activation of both the parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous systems. And this is pretty uncommon and rare, but nonetheless it has been found previously in the literature where we have both arousal in the situation, some sort of stressful event, and social sensitivity as well. So this has been found in caring for infants. This is work from Sue Carter's lab. And all of, if you've cared for an infant, you know that that involves a bit of stress, as well as a lot of oxytocin. Crying as well, social crying. And sexual activity, again, another activity that involves both arousal and affection or connection. We also looked at neural activity, specifically in the medial prefrontal cortex, which is responsible for, um, well, it has a dual relationship, and I'm, I'm glad we brought this up earlier, that it doesn't necessarily regulate the brainstem and the parasympathetic nervous system, but it definitely communicates with these areas, and so there seems to be a reciprocal connection there. Previous work has shown that vagus nerve activity does relate to neural activity in this particular region of the brain as well. And so we use um, functional near-infrared spectroscopy, which is basically uh, a poor lady's fMRI looking at blood flow oxygenation, um, very similar to looking at the bold signal in neuroimaging studies. And what we found is the prefrontal cortex actually deactivates, or goes offline during moral elevation. And again, we weren't necessarily predicting this, but we know that this particular neural region, which is responsible um, for things like higher order thinking and analysis, is also where the ego resides. So when you're really thinking about yourself versus others, um, we also see it um, activate um, when we're basically keeping things online. And what we found is that this deactivation would directly relate to how much people were elevated. So how much were they morally lifted? The deactivation corresponded to their reports of admiration, inspiration, hope, sympathy, compassion, and this desire to help others and to be a better person. And as I mentioned, this area has also been shown to relate to social evaluations, ego awareness, and judging others, and making moral judgments. So we thought it might go online. But the fact that it went offline suggests that when you're not kind of busy scrutinizing things or 
putting yourself in it, you're able to kind of let go and to let this moral elevation, these emotions wash over your physiology when your prefrontal cortex goes offline. And this area is really key for time travel. So thinking about the past, predicting the future. So by it, um, basically deactivating, you're more living in the present moment. Now, we didn't find moral elevation to relate to genetic predisposition or to parental bonding so far. But the one thing that did come out was that people who were receiving affection in their daily lives um, actually were more elevated. So it's almost like they have more oxytocin coursing through their system thanks to their loved ones. And that allows them to be a better person. And remember, this is the same group that was more helpful um, in our helping task. And so people who receive affection um, report more compassion, hope, upliftedness, and so forth. So next, we're going to actually measure oxytocin, um, focusing on mothers. See how this relates to pro-social behaviors with the mother and child, and also how the child behaves later in life. Um, I'd also like to induce moral elevation in children. So if any of you have great stimuli or ideas about that, I'm all ears. And often when I give a talk, I'm asked about magic tricks for prosociality. Um, can't we just pass around um, the oxytocin in the room or bomb Syria and the Ukraine with oxytocin bombs and everything will be better? Um, unfortunately, it's not that easy. Artificial oxytocin administration has been shown to promote things that I mentioned before, such as eye contact, trust, and generosity, but it's also been shown to boost things like envy and gloating. And so it's not um, this one-trick pony. It's actually a very clever way of modulating the self-other behavior. It, it um, produces in-group love, but it also boosts out-group hate. And so it's, it's a very tricky situation that we're um, facing with oxytocin. Oxytocin can also cause um, epigenetic variations, and I can go into that more in the Q&A or afterwards if you're interested about that as well. But luckily, there are lots of natural ways to boost prosociality, as I mentioned, by building our social bonds with loved ones and strangers that'll boost our circulating oxytocin levels in all of us. Of course, being good parents and good teachers and good friends will also boost it, and like re receiving a perfection in turn. Um, you can also boost your oxytocin levels with things like massages and so forth. And our new data is suggesting by witnessing and performing these compassionate acts, just watching it, even on a video screen, is enough to boost your vagal tone, probably your oxytocin levels, and that in turn will increase your desire to be a better person. And so being pro-social is amazingly, amazingly beneficial to both your body and the brain. We're over this old idea that we need to be selfish in order to survive. It really is the survival of the kindness. Kind is. And therefore, being a really good person is also very, very good for you. With that, I thank you.